So, officially now, welcome to the panel on linguists in technical communication. Uh, I'm Sue Lindner, your moderator, and Marcus Robinson is our Zoom producer. And um, he will help me keep an eye on the chat as well as providing links to useful resources in the chat. Well, in, in Jenny, Jenny Reddish's presentation a few weeks ago, I learned all about the bite, snack, and meal approach to introducing topics. So I thought I'd introduce this session by giving a bite about technical communication, uh, and our panel will expand it into a meal. So it turns out that the bite is quite a mouthful. Our professional organization, which is the Society for Technical Communication, or STC, devotes a full page to top-level descriptions of jobs in the field. Um, and I have a link to that, but if somebody else could find it, it's stc.org, about STC, and defining technical communication. But here's my bite. Basically, for me, technical communication is the art of developing an information interface to a technical or specialized product or topic. And my snack would be that technical com communication involves expressing relevant information clearly and developing it in efficient and accessible ways, typically to people who need to learn to do something correctly, efficiently, and even safely. Happily enough, this translates into a wide variety of jobs that linguists are well suited for such as writing, editing, training, localization, and um, even some overlap into web design, user experience design, and, and more. So with us today are panelists who have linguistics backgrounds and who have established careers in one or more job areas of technical communication. Um, so Kate Deheer is a technical writing lead. You can wave at us, um, a technical writing lead at Salesforce. And in this job, she has developed writing standards and guidelines that are used by over 200 technical writers. She holds a patent for a system to organize and manage user interface text. And as I just found out, she writes great error messages. So, and then uh, Madeline Adkins has a bachelor's and a master's degree in linguistics. And she has worked uh, in technical communications, leadership planning, teaching, and instructional design. She's also done training and consulting for Japanese and United States US businesses uh, in the area of intercultural communication. So there she is. Yay. And then Joe Devney has been a technical writer since the mid 90s, uh, mostly writing about software. In 2008, he earned a master's degree in sociolinguistics at Georgetown University, and since then has considered both technical writing and linguistics as his careers. So, and then just about me, I'm a, I actually am a linguistics PhD, and I turned tech writer about 39 years ago. Um, I have been writing doc, I have written documentation mostly for software developers and database products and mostly for Silicon Valley startup uh, companies and I am newly retired. So on with the meal. So I think the first um, first first off, I, I'd like each of you to tell us about your journey into technical communication. And I'm wondering if we could start with Madeline. How did you get there? Where did you start? And how did you get there? <laughs> Mine was an interesting journey and perhaps not typical. Um, right after college, I moved to Japan and I started teaching English. And a friend of mine who was leaving about a year after I got to Japan, essentially handed me a job doing technical writing or more like editing for Matsushita, which is a, a big conglomerate in Japan, and, and we know here mostly as Panasonic, but uh, this was their kitchen appliance division, and I worked mostly on rice cookers and toaster ovens, uh, and I got to work on the first bread, bread machine? Yeah, 
So that was really cool. Um, so that was just an amazing coincidence that I, I got that opportunity and I liked it, but I kind of filed that away because uh, the career I went into when I got back to the States was uh, intercultural communication training. And uh, at some point the company I was working for started to downsize and was sort of heading towards disappearing. And I realized that if I didn't want to hang my shingle out, I had to move in a different direction. And I basically realized a good career move was technical communication. Uh, I'd grown up in a family of, of writers and editors and people who obsessed about grammar and words. And so in addition to my linguistics, I knew I had a strong writing background and felt confident making that switch. And I got my first full-time job by going to an STC meeting. Mm -hmm. And I think it was my second STC meeting. And I met a recruiter and he, he basically created that job for me because he found out that I had knowledge of French and Japanese and he knew a company that would benefit from that. And so I ended up getting hired by the division of Sony that makes PlayStation. And I, so my first full-time job was actually working on the PlayStation 1, uh, updating those documents for the user manuals, and then working on PlayStation 2 uh, a little bit. And then, um, what, did, what do I want to say after that? Um, it, it was really key for me, obviously, the networking. I had a backup plan, which was at STC, I met somebody and I was going to work with them on some things and they gave me some pointers and I was going to work on developing my portfolio and, and this chance meeting with this recruiter kind of accelerated it. Mm -hmm. But it was through networking that I really got into the field. And, and what kind of linguistics experience did you have at that point when you started out? So I had my bachelor's in linguistics. Bachelor's. Mm -hmm. And obviously at that point I had teaching experience under my belt. Um, I hadn't, I had probably done a couple of freelance things, but I, ha I hadn't really worked as a writer. Mm -hmm. But again, I had, I had an unusual background. My father was a copy editor. And so I mm -hmm. had like more than the average amount of uh, right. training and good writing. So, right. so I had that in the linguistics for me, I knew that trained my brain to be logical. And mm -hmm. that's really one of the keys with the tech writing is Absolutely. being logical. Cool. Um, Joe, how about you? How did you get there, get here from there? Uh, into technical writing. Um, back when I was young, back about college age, I took some training in, uh, data processing, which was programming and a lot of other stuff. Never got very much of a job in IT. I was a computer tape librarian, which shows you how long ago that was. Um, but then uh, several years later, uh, at about the same time, I graduated from college and got laid off from my corporate job. So I looked for a new, um, a new career because I thought it was time to, to do that. Um, way I got, I decided that technical writing would be a good fit for me because in college I had done an awful lot of writing and my teachers liked my writing and I had the technical domain knowledge to bring to the field. Uh, so I, I won't go into detail about uh, how I found my first job because you can't do it anymore. It involves newspapers and postal letters. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I got a job um, writing system administrator manuals for subsidiary, mm -hmm. subsidiary of the phone company. And then you kind of added linguistics later, is that? Yes, I had a little bit of linguistics background. Before that, I've been mm -hmm. obsessed with language my whole life. I've read a lot of books about language. Mm -hmm. um, in my college uh, days, I had um, I took a couple of linguistics classes, classes as part of my um, uh, minor in communication arts. Uh, but then I had been a tech writer for about 10 years and I decided I wasn't really doing anything new and exciting. So I decided I needed some new, uh, some more credentials. And I started looking around for uh, master's degree programs 
and I found one at Georgetown that sounded very interesting. And I realized that if I worked really hard, I could get through it quickly and get, get, then get back to work. So I took a year sabbatical and got my degree. Very cool. Yeah. Great, thank you. And Kate, how about you? What was your odyssey like? Um, I was a French language major, uh, so I, I took linguistics and translation courses as part of that. Um, uh, we, my father was from the Netherlands and uh, nobody speaks Dutch, so Dutch people have to learn different languages. <laughs> so I was, my father was good at languages and I was always encouraged to study various ones. So I ended up majoring in, in French and, and kind of went abroad and so on. And then I, I didn't have any special idea what I was going to do, except that I, everyone assumed that I was going to be a teacher and I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. And some people would say, oh, well, you could be a flight attendant. And um, sure. I would just say that I didn't like wearing polyester. And so <laughs> then um, a friend of mine, I just sort of wandered into this internship in the publications department of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Uh, and that introduced me to um, publishing. And I made a contact there with somebody at um, Random House had a little uh, office in San Francisco where they did foreign language and biology college textbooks. And so I ended up getting my first real job there and worked there for five years. And that was a really great um, background for everything else that I did, all the technical writing that I did later. I, I use that background still to this day. Mm -hmm. And um, and from my linguistics uh, coursework, I, I I got uh, kind of a, a very structured and mathematical sort of um, notions of, of language. So you've got, uh, if you think of language as an equation where you have vocabulary and syntax on one side of the equal sign, meaning on the other, um, that sort of way of thinking has been really helpful to me. And I think also the, the, um, the structure in, in, in implied in linguistics also has been really helpful to me in, in developing technical documentation. I, I have found that not all technical writers have that ability to really understand structure. And mm -hmm. so that's something that my linguistics background has been, has really helped me with. I, you know, I, in, when I uh, graduated from college or even uh, when I left that my first job, I could not have imagined the internet, but the internet's been really good to me. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I think, you know, to everyone here. And, and so I have worked on a lot of websites and for various software mm -hmm. companies. And, and now, um, you know, as you said, I work, um, yeah. I work at Salesforce and uh, most of my job there is writing user interface text. Um, yeah which again, that, that sort of mathematical approach to language has been really useful for that very constrained con writing context. Yeah, I often feel like I constructed sentences. I didn't just kind of, you know, author them. I, I, I actually kind of put them together so they said what they needed to say. It is a very structured mathematical kind of approach. And also just being able to draw pictures of software again it's that structure you linguists think in terms of tree structures or networks you know representing information in that way is pretty natural to to us so i and just, so my journey was um i actually finished a doctorate had a postdoc and then realized i needed to support myself and there were no jobs available. So I went to the career planning and placement office on campus, which um, did a lot of what this uh, LCL program, the, the career management track, you know, looking at resumes, um, understanding your skill set, becoming conscious and aware of your skill set and mapping them on to the skill set that your target uh, career needed and learning how to talk about that learning all about informational interviewing. That was a new concept. And they even set us up with some interviews um, and giving us lots of good guidance for how to, um, 
how to how to repackage ourselves as uh, non-academics and. Uh, but like everybody else, I sort of had that side interest. Mine was publications. Um, I had edited yearbooks and, um, and some other kinds of journals. Um, so I'd always liked presenting written information. And it turns out that that plus the linguistics was a real helpful thing. And so I became a, a software writer um, for 40 years. So uh, good. Um, so. I thought maybe it would be fun if we could tell, talk about maybe a project or two that show what it's like to work, uh, to do the kind of work you do. Um, uh, Joe, start with you. Do, do you? Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, the easiest uh, job, I've done a lot of different things along the way. The easiest one to explain for this audience, I think, is having a regular corporate job as a technical writer in a, a software development department, which I did for a few years for Vodafone. That's the big cell phone company based in Europe. Uh, they have an office uh, uh, not too far from where I live. Uh, this was for technical audiences. Um, as the new, the new software, that what the product I was working on was called Vodafone Live. It was like, like the very beginning of smart where you get a multiple application on your phone. It would have to be administered in data centers around the world at the different uh, Vodafone offices in different countries. And that was my audience. So it was technical. Um, and also many of them did not have uh, English as their first or sometimes even second language. So I had to keep that in mind when I was writing. So my uh, cultural communication classes helped there. Um, yeah. How, how did you learn about your audience? I mean, if they were very technical and you were somewhat technical, but perhaps not in their area of technical expertise. Um, you don't have to actually know how to do your audience's job. Uh, you just have to understand like the environment they work in, what sorts of things they work with. I knew the concepts. I know what a data mm -hmm. center is. I know about passing data and installing applications. And, mm -hmm. So I, I could not go do their job, but I could explain those aspects of their job that our software helped them do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. And um, so uh, what I delivered was uh, system administrator guides and application administrator guides, pretty technical stuff. My subject matter experts were the software developers who were building the product. Mm -hmm. Did, so did you worked primarily with the those engineers or software developers or did you work with other writers or editors? Uh, I, um, there, it was a, a two person technical writing shop. So um, mm -hmm. me and one other writer. Mm -hmm. I have only had one job where there was a separate team of editors to what I wrote. And I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> Wasn't it wonderful? I had one of those jobs too. I adored it. Yeah. But mostly I had been a writer slash editor for my whole career. Yeah, same here. Good. All right. Cool. Um, Madeline. All right. Um, I'll mention more than two, but very briefly, sure. just to get because I've done a lot of different things. So um, the first one I want to mention is McKesson. I worked uh, on a project. One of the things that I did was to document the processes inside a uh, distribution center as they were changing the technology they used mm -hmm. there. And um, that was very hard because all of the SMEs, all of the SMEs, uh, subject matter experts. Experts, are, yes. Yeah. The so, people you get so, your information from, yeah. So all those people were working at the distribution center, setting things up and they were working 12 hour days and they were very tired and they were not reading their emails and answering them. Mm -hmm. So I ended up flying out there for five weeks to Memphis and then it was really easy to document because I could catch people during a lull and I could see things for myself and I could get help from other people than the people that were officially assigned to, to help me. Cause that's actually one of the big challenges and that's why I'm mentioning it with, with technical communication you're often having to work around other people's schedules and other people's kind of demanding situations. 
to get the information. So in my case, going there was the key. Um, in recent years, uh, I've had two contracts at Apple. The first one was uh, a content migration project. So moving content from one old website to a new one, but it wasn't, um, not just moving it, we had to update the content, we had to validate it, we had to make sure it was current. Um, so there was actually a lot of rewriting and that actually meant just a lot of one-on-ones with the experts, with the SMEs and um, just creating a bunch of new content. And so that's an example of, of a situation where I knew, uh, you know, I know some HTML, I can, I can set up a website. So you know, you needed those skills to do that as well as really good mm -hmm. interview skills. Um, the second one at Apple was uh, developing a new hire training program for, um, which this was listed as a tech comms role, but it mm -hmm. really, really was was very much in my bailiwick of, of also being a trainer and, and a, a, you know, curriculum developer. So um, anyway, developing a new hire training program for uh, some big data, uh, new hires. And the thing about that was, again, there were a lot of different experts. And in that case, I often worked with them to document or I took their documentation or for the soft skills, I created it based on knowledge I had. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's a, a different kind of role. Um, then the recently I've gotten into UX writing and content strategy, and that's where I'm at right now. And so I've worked with uh, two banks and the first one was was Chase where I was working on the um it's called a uh oh I'm gonna blank on the name ah it's written down let me look at my note um it's working on a uh you don't care anyway so <laughs> the first one was a little more one-on-one -on -one. it was a little more like what I think of as typical tech writing and the second one uh where I'm wor working now at Wells Fargo they um I'm working on website content mm -hmm. so we work with teams and we work with a lot of different people so it's important to be aware of what kinds of jobs and this is i think more typical of, of ux writing and content strategy is, is working with a lot of people and having to have a high level of kind of uh, meeting skills and dealing with personalities and you know all those interesting things that are not technical but are key mm -hmm. to success so what is what is content strategy as opposed to say technical writing I, I'm actually not clear on the concept it's funny because there's different people in in the business world who use the term differently so mm -hmm. in, apparently that term is also used in marketing so hmm. if it's content strategy and marketing, very different focus from like what I'm doing, which is, you know, making things accessible on the website so that customers and potential customers have ease of use, mm -hmm. uh, you know, helping you to do what you need to do with your bank, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's different. And then within UX writing, kind of the UX, if you have a role that's called UX writer, you're probably focused day to day more on the writing, more on the a word to word, sentence to sentence level. Mm -hmm. And if you're a content strategist, you might be doing that, but you also, or you may exclusively be doing the big picture, holistic view of what content needs to go where. And it's a little more like informa information architecture. And um, mm -hmm. so it's a little more leadership or advanced role. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Um, and Kate, what kind of projects uh, have, um, really kind of typify your your career well let's see i'll i'll um writing error I'll, messages I'll, I'll do yeah writing error messages yes uh, um but to get so i'll start with i have a few and starting with um my first actual tech writing project was a, a couple about three years after i had left random house i had a different sort of job in between. And then I, I got this gig writing um, a step-by-step -step guide to wiring classrooms for the internet for a project called Net Day across the state of California. Um, and, 
you know, I didn't know anything. So I learned a lot of things. That's one of the things I love about technical writing is you learn about all kinds of weird stuff that you would never know about otherwise. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm the only French major I know who can wire category five cable. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I, so the way I did that was they, they provided, uh, you know, people who knew what they were doing. And I, I had interviews, I, they gave me a photographer as well. And they, they had, I had interviews with, um, someone who installs cable for a living. And that's when I learned that part of my job <laughs> was, um, sorting and prioritizing this, I, I, the, the, was a woman actually who her, her father had been an electrician and now she does electrician stuff, but does internet stuff and, and uh, installations. And I said, well, she had been going over some facts and I said, well, which thing is more important? And she looked at me and said, it's all important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, <laughs> so as a, writer, you know that you can't say it all at once and, you, right. you know, people using your stuff can't absorb it all at once. So you have to learn to sort and prioritize and you, 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 you're a, a lot of your job as a, a technical communicator is, is just learning to ask questions and mm -hmm. sift through what you get back and, and figure out how to, you know, how to organize it. So, um, that was sort of how I got my start in tech writing. And then uh, people started asking me, oh, were, you know, are, were you computer scientist? You could, no. no um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then I, I had several, I worked for Intuit and Adobe and uh, in the late 90s worked for a whole bunch of different startups that don't exist anymore and mm -hmm. professional associations and so on. And some of the content was um, was technical, uh, um, and some of it wasn't, it was for, you know, I did, I did things for educational, uh, uh nonprofits and education nonprofits. And that wasn't that, that material wasn't technical, but the ability to kind of gather information and think about it in this new context, social context of, well, websites and the internet, um, and and then put it together for ordinary people who were not in mm -hmm. the technology business that was that was a you know big part of what i was doing and then continues to be at salesforce because most salesforce users are not um technical they're salespeople or or shop owners or you know um that's the whole idea is to provide something that's easy for people <clears throat> to use even if they're not technical. So, and at Salesforce, I, I work on, I have worked on a huge range of stuff and I mentioned um, my publishing background before. And so I, I, I like Madeline have um, found that background really useful. And so I've created a whole uh, a, a series of um, guidelines and stand standards for other writers to use that the writing group has grown tremendously since I joined Salesforce and mm -hmm. um, I work on, you know, I've written standards for user interface text and for various kinds of documentation. Um, in particular, uh, we, when Salesforce went to DITA, which stands for Darwin, it doesn't matter what it stands for, but it's a structured uh, way of creating technical documentation. And, and when Salesforce adopted, did a somewhat as a standard, um, we had to, writers had not previously written uh, what's called a short description, a short desk, uh, which is part of what you, you need it to make did a work. And uh, so suddenly we were all supposed to start including this element in our documentation and release notes. And I, I, I thought, oh my gosh, people are just gonna put whatever in that <laughs> between those tags, we have to have some guidelines. So another writer and I developed uh, release note specific guidelines um, that are you know still in use now that it's all about making the release notes work not sort of one topic at a time but uh, um, the way the short descriptions and the titles are written 
help each topic become, you know, work in the, the bigger system that, that did it mm -hmm. is and explain at every level what is new mm -hmm. um, each release at Salesforce. Uh, so that's, that's been a, that was a yeah. key accomplishment. Um, yeah. So your audience there were sort of in-house writers, essentially. Right. Uh -huh. Learning how to, and you were helping them do their job, which is, I, I guess I had a, a project where I wrote a template for a functional specification for our engineers to use because these engineers, well, or software developers would be inventing new features to add to our product. And very often they just would have an idea and they'd just start coding, nothing wrong with prototyping, but they'd get to this place where there would be mission creep. It would start doing different things than they expected it to do and or more or less, et cetera. So we decided to have a functional specification where they could actually sort of prototype on paper and describe what it is they were going to add to the product and who was going to use it and why would they care. And I, you know, just made they? all those different kinds of, they had to address each one of those points before, um, and then it would get approved by the, the um, the marketing people and the and well all all the stakeholders the engineering group qa uh, customer support um you know did we really think this was a, a good feature and uh, was it well thought out did it skip any steps you know that was another fun thing is is reading reading something for consistent consistency and completeness which i think linguists can do very well and you'd say oh you've told me how to you know, edit this thing and delete it, but and uh, turn it around, rename it. But how do you create it? You know, oh, well, I guess we should tell them that. So it was a good. But at any rate, the uh, writing for for the in-house audience can be just as important. It helps people get their facts straight um, internally. So. Well, so you've all kind of touched on these things. I, actually, had you finished? You were going to talk about several projects. I think you did. Um, um, yeah. yeah, no, I, 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 I hold a patent on, um, it's a nice thing about working at Salesforce is yeah. they, they pay for nice. patent applications. And mm -hmm. so I hold a patent on um, organizing and managing user interface text. Mm -hmm. So I think you all touched on this, but maybe we can talk a little more about ways in which your linguistics background has helped you get your job done. Um, you know, what are your, or put another way, what what jobs or tasks have really benefited from your linguistic superpowers? So, I don't know, somebody jump in. Joe. Um, okay, yeah. Um, I think what has helped me specifically from linguistics is um, syntax, learning syntax and uh, semantics. And I, something I did not study formally, but I've read a lot about is psycholinguistics, which is how the, the brain actually interprets language and produces it. And that's really helped my editing a lot uh, because, you know, it, basic copy editing is just fixing the gram grammatical errors and things like that. But uh, what I'm doing now is more just, not just untangling sentences, but I can explain in detail why this version that you had is harder for the reader to understand and how the new version is easier for reader to understand mm -hmm. because there are two important things that technical writing specifically has to have. What you write has to be um, you have, the reader has to understand it. it, has to be accurate, they can't misread it and think something else because that can lead to user error, you don't want that. And also, it has to be absorbed quickly. The, the people need to find out what they need to learn, what to do, and go back to their job. The, you don't want, um, they don't want to read a whole page if they can get back, get something done in half a page. So right. they're busy people. <laughs> they're busy people. And our job or, or my SME's job is built around the software we're building. Um, for the, the audience, for the uh, people who are reading the book, no, the, the, the software is just a tool to do their, help them do their regular mm -hmm. job. So the, my job is to get the information into the brains 
quickly and accurately. And so that's what I focus mm -hmm. on. I, I like your point about the psycholinguistics or the, the processing speed that people take information in. I used to think of myself as feeding them a rope gently. You don't want to like dump the whole rope on top of them. You want them, you know, to get just a little bit at a time to uh, so they can kind of ingest it and ingest it. You're you're coming up with the explanatory strategy for how this information can be learned by somebody. And um, you kind of have to start. What do I start with first? And then how do I pace the uh, Yes, yeah. what do they need to know to do the next step. Mm -hmm. And actually, there I have an analogy from my work at Vodafone, where the um, there was limited bandwidth for getting uh, data out to the, the people's phones. And so the engineers had to work on, uh, had to design things to minimize server calls. They didn't have that phone to stop doing what it's doing, go back to the server, get some new information. So mm -hmm. it's sort of the same thing in, um, in my technical writing, I'm trying to make efficiency like that. Mm -hmm. The more tens of milliseconds you can save in uh, cognitive uh, activity, the better. Sounds good. Um, Madeline, how about you? What what linguistic superpowers do you bring to your job that have helped you and um, your users? I want to give an example, but first I just want to sure. second or third what you all just said, because like right now, especially in in uh, UX writing and content strategy, one of my jobs is literally to represent the, the customer mm -hmm. or the potential customer and look at their interests because that's not what every, you know, not everybody's thinking carefully about that. And so mm -hmm. the designer and I are really the ones who are speaking up for that. Um, Right. Well, you're looking at the product from the outside in and not instead of the inside out. So that's. Um, yeah, because there's always, you know, like there's competing um, products out there and competing companies. So we got to make our product appealing and easy to use friendly. Mm -hmm. um, so the example I want to give though is from when I was at Sony working on the PlayStation and uh, when the when we started working on PlayStation 2, there was a naming conventions project because you have to name all the buttons and things on the console itself. They have to have names. And this was when things were very new, like like we had to have some very original names for things. So that had to be translated into all the languages of all the manuals and, and to cover all the countries of the world. And I forget if it was like 26 or 36. It was a lot of languages. And uh, so I was in charge of this project and we used a company that did the translations. And I've studied a lot of languages that always helps if you have that background. Uh, but of course, I don't know 26 or 36 languages. Uh, so here I was receiving the translations on these part names. And I remember and this is absolutely my linguistics training because you're trained how to look for patterns. You know how to recognize a pattern and you know how to recognize when a pattern is not happening. So what I noticed was there was mistakes in the Arabic, which I really don't speak, I don't even know the writing system, and Swedish, which I don't speak. And I was able to say, uh, we have a problem. There are translation errors in the Arabic and the Swedish. And I have to say at first, people didn't believe me, mm -hmm. but I did get my point across that there was a problem. And when it was researched, yes, there was a problem and we had to get a whole new translation uh, for those languages. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't have done that if I hadn't had my linguistics training. Mm -hmm. Or I, I won't say I couldn't have. I think my linguistics training provided me with an excellent background to achieve that. Yeah, being able to look at paradigms and uh, you know understand, aha, here's the regularities, and whoa, what what's going on with that? And maybe it is irregular, but probably it's not. And it, it's it's always worth questioning. I think um, I think we yeah, <laughs> I've certainly experienced that as well. Great example. Cool. Um, and Kate, how about you? Well, I really. Yeah, plus one about mm -hmm. pattern matching oh, right. and generalization. Um, uh, you know, especially in a 
in a multimedia environment i think that the structure inherent in in linguistics um you know i just agree with madeline it just gives you uh really helps you perceive problems in in language and i that's a fascinating example madeline i i know many times i have uh, looked at a sentence and lo looked at something and and i knew there was a maybe i knew next to nothing about the subject matter but i could tell from the language that something something was wrong because you know linguistically um and you know a number of times i've you know pointed out you know sometimes sometimes if you point out mistakes people think that you're just being their older sister or their high school mm -hmm. english teacher or something and they but but you know plenty of times people have looked and said oh that's a terrible mistake i mean not language wise but content wise mm -hmm. i'm so glad you caught that mm -hmm. i didn't catch I only caught their mistake because it showed up as a structural problem in mm -hmm. their language. It's and it it's it's weird. It's almost like a, a right brain non-language thing to see those patterns and and identify them. Um but um yeah, that's a really interesting part mm -hmm. of my job. I'm just seeing if there's anything else. And then it, oh, just the whole thing about the whole ability to to get to precision in in language and and precision the precision you can achieve and convey meaning mm -hmm. um you know when you have a linguistics background I right think it's just really important and i i think it's only going to get more important uh you know in in the future um mm -hmm. you know working with different technologies um well, certainly being able to disambiguate sentences, you know, where you you have a sentence that could, you often get sentences from, say, engineers that can mean multiple things, or you get them from other writers, even in bad documentation. And and the reviewers can will read whatever they think is reality into those sentences, so they don't necessarily notice it. I would rather write something that was clear and unambiguous and wrong because then that will get caught by the reviewer. But if it's kind of, you know, we used to call it lizard dancing. It was just kind of like, oh, it kind of looks like this. And, uh, you know, people can just kind of project into it whatever they want to see. It's a big Rorschach test. You know, documentation is a Rorschach test. They can read into it whatever they think the truth is, but it doesn't. But then the poor reader, you know, user kind of looks at this and goes, what are they trying to tell me? Yeah, and that, that's a that's a thing that I have fought against, you know, and going back to my mathematical notions about language, if you have vocabulary and syntax, you know, if language is an equation, meaning is an equation, you've got vocabulary, vocabulary and syntax on one side of the equal sign and meaning on the other, you can't just declare the meaning. It, it, on the other side it, mm -hmm. it's a consequence right. of the vocabulary and syntax um and so that's kind of what i mean about precision and conveying yeah you know, yeah well, and the fun part too is that you're you're actually kind of it's. I used to characterize my job as being a very high level language or high high level programmer in a language called English, and and I had a different compiler for every reader that was reading my document, and um, you know if they could all kind of come to consensus about what conceptual model I was conveying, then I had done my job. But um, if everybody sort of had a different idea of what was going on, then it was time to do a revision. So. Um, or three or four. So, well, um, any other good superpowers that linguists offer? Shall we move on to? Are there any other tech career, uh, tech communication career opportunities that we haven't talked about yet and that seem fairly well suited to linguistics? Definitely the, you know, the area of voice, and I think you've had a whole panel on that, but mm -hmm. I mean, definitely the whole, the whole voice area offers a lot of opportunity to a linguist, especially if they're either 
data oriented or conversation oriented. There's a lot you could do that way. And that's kind of, you could see it as an offshoot of tech comms for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one thing to it sort of gets into the next topic maybe, but I think it's really important for each of you to think about like, what are the skills I bring other than linguistics? And often as, as the case with my Japanese and French that got me that first full-time gig, often it's the, the combination of skills you have that get you there, mm -hmm. that get you the job. Right, right. Um, do you, what kinds of things have you folks had to learn on the job? Sounds like quite a few <laughs> things. <laughs> Cables and Vodafone and uh, yeah. Joe, what? Um, I, I usually, I, uh, I try to keep up with technology. I know uh, I read about a lot, a lot about science. What I learned on the job is the specifics for that particular company, that particular product. So I talked about Vodafone and I, I learned there and elsewhere uh, about what's involved in getting cell phones to work, things like that. Um, and just, um, I try not to start at zero when I start a new job. So I, I know the, uh, I know the basics of whatever they're working on to some level. And I just uh, mm -hmm. sit down and with, especially if I can sit down for inventing it, for building it, uh, I will learn specifics about that job, that particular product, how it's different from others on the market or what came before. Yeah, what kind of tools um, do you guys use? And did, did you have to learn about those on the job or go off and take courses? Or, you know, what would our, what would our, our linguists, career linguists here need to go do? I've used a lot of Microsoft Word, I have to say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Excel and numbers and mm -hmm. uh, pages. And um, so like for me, it's been a lot of the really basic business tools, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it really depends on the job and it depends mm -hmm. on what's sort of a corporate culture. Yeah, I yeah. had to use, oh, go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I use whatever my employer or my client is using. Mm -hmm. And yes, a lot of times that does mean Microsoft Word. And sometimes I would tell uh, tell people, you know, you want a very complex document here. Word is not really the tool. I mean, you might want to switch to a publishing platform like uh, Adobe FrameMaker. And they say, no, everybody knows Word. We're going to keep that. So I've mm -hmm. learned a lot about how Word works just because I've had to. Uh, but I did have to uh, take uh, take a class to understand, to get started with Adobe FrameMaker. FrameMaker seems to be fading now and it's being replaced by um, uh, Madcap Flare mm -hmm. and maybe one or two others out there. Um, so those yeah. are the tools that I use the most often. I guess I've used, um, I, I, I adored my years using FrameMaker. I think it, yeah. it, it is such a sane uh, package, but I agree it's it's been kind of fading out for reasons I don't quite understand, maybe cost. Um, but yeah, Flare seems to be taking its place. Um, Dreamweaver, I guess, I don't know if that's still happening, but for HTML Dream, authoring. Around, it's only yeah. on subscription now. Uh -huh. um, but if you're, if your job involves making websites, you should really know Dreamweaver. Yes, mm -hmm. and okay. and I've also used uh, Markdown, I guess. For um... Mark Markdown is fairly new. At least I haven't heard yeah. about it except in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. But it's super easy. There's not mm -hmm. much to it. Um, so yeah, you can fun. probably learn that in an hour yeah. or two, and then say yes, mm -hmm. I'm qualified to do Markdown. Mm -hmm. In the UX world, you have to know or you don't have to be an expert, but you have to get comfortable with things like Sketch or mm -hmm. I think of Figma, um, Envision, those kinds of tools, mm -hmm. which designers, you know, um, designers uh, develop their images in and share them. Mm -hmm. and so you have to know a little bit, at least mm -hmm. get comfortable with using their tools. Well, I Salesforce, um, 
I, 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 my experience was similar to, to what Joe and Madeline have described when I was uh, consulting. Um, at Salesforce, we have pretty different, we, I, it's been a really different thing. We have a lot of in-house uh, tools. Some of them are bespoke that we use. We have, um, we use something called Perforce for checking documentation, checking in documentation mm. into the code. We, we use Oxygen. Um, we uh, use a lot of um, Google, I haven't used Word in a long time, only the legal department seems to use Word and Salesforce. Mm -hmm. So we use a lot of Google Docs and Google Spreadsheets, which makes it possible to um, collaborate with other people, other mm -hmm. writers and other people on things. I, I don't know what, I don't know how we would operate without that. Mm -hmm. you know, it's people being able to just go in and, and work on a, a document and not be thinking about version management and what version is, is saved where and so on. So we do a lot of our drafting and finalization of things in, in applications like that. And then of course there's Salesforce, um, which is huge and no one knows how to use it all, but depending on which features I'm working, I've worked on various features during my nine years there with, you know, with different teams developing different parts of it. And so, um, you know, I have to I have to use it at least to some degree to do um, documentation, um, and it, it's just sort of a um, it's a constant learning process. <laughs> how does this feature work? How does that feature work? Why is why am I not able to do this? Oh, because this other setting. So um, there's a lot of troubleshooting and just figuring things out um, that we have to do in-house. Um, I mean, there is, you know, some support, but uh, yeah, it's not, not just down to sort of simple, simple mm -hmm. tools. And then I'm going to put something in the chat here. It's my, uh, one of my favorite quotes by a, a, a Zen Abbott, who is also a, a writer. I mean, a, also a, yeah, he's a poet and he's a Zen Abbott. Um, here in the Bay Area, as quoted in Wired Magazine, who says, the real technology behind all of our other technologies is language. And I just like that because that's, it's so true. It's, you know, there's all this, all these other tools come and go and, you know, but you as a writer know the basic things that you want to do and okay, mm -hmm. This, this year I'll use this tool and, you know, for the next client, I'll use this other tool. But you, you know, as a writer, you know, the kinds of things that you want to, that you want to mm -hmm. do. I'd like that quote. Nice. Yeah. Well, I have I one to, more. I want to jump in at, with one other comment about Microsoft mm -hmm. Word. Um, for these people who, the attendees who want to move into technical writing, if you're going to consider yourself a, uh, a professional tech writer, you need to know more about Word than just how it's like a typewriter. You have to understand how to use paragraph tags and character tags, things like that, or paragraph style, excuse me. Um, yeah. Because that's how you get, that's how you format the document, that's how you make it consistent all the way through, that's how uh, you can make changes more effortlessly than going through and fixing it. It helps you organize the document. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I want to add something learn all that too. stuff. Oh, sorry, don't want to interrupt. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Something else, which in the last decade, no matter where I go, they, they've got some kind of CMS, content management system. Oh yeah, talk about they, that. Yeah, they, they were around before that, but really it's just everywhere you go, there's a CMS now. It's often in my experience, something like Confluence, but it can be other things. They're not, hard to learn but that's actually one of the challenges is they they hope you already know that that you don't need to spend a lot of time learning that right. um, and basically a, a content management system exists to manage the various versions of the various pieces of documentation and code for that matter right i mean so you can put together combinations of the correct versions of things 
that's that certainly originally when I used them like at Sony that that was the mm -hmm. objective but now it's like mm -hmm. everything's on the CMS right. that that's kind of the file box but right. well I shouldn't say that because there are other ways to but but it can happen that that becomes also the general file box or information source about different groups and projects and stuff. So learning the CMS and learning it quickly mm -hmm. is really important. So does anybody out there have any questions? Uh, please put them in the chat or raise a hand um, or be thinking about them. We're kind of coming toward the close of things. Um, probably my last question of the panelists is what advice would you have for uh, linguists who are perhaps thinking about a job in technical communication? What, what kinds of things should they, how should they prepare themselves, build their portfolio, um, use STC resources, anything that seems useful? Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll jump in. Uh, STC is a good resource and what I re would recommend is find the closest STC chapter and go to their meetings. Mm -hmm. Because typically at an STC meeting, my chapter has them once a month. There's always uh, a guest speaker talking about some aspect of technical communication. So you'll learn something that way. And uh, you also get a chance to talk to and network with them, learn from veterans in the field who can tell you what tools you need, what what uh, companies you might want to talk to about jobs, where you can pick up new skills. Um, we, for the last year or so, of course, everything's been on Zoom, where you miss a lot of that. But uh, I hope everything goes back to in-person because that's, that's a much richer experience. Uh, so I mentioned that. Certainly building up a network is essential. That's how I got my first job. I, I had prepared like crazy, but then what really made the difference was running into an old college pal and who said, oh, you know, the last job I worked at, the tech writer there is uh, is hiring. So why don't you, you know, submit an application? Um, so I think, you know, uh, set STC chapters are a great way to build your network as well. So and I think in the previous, um, um, in, in Kate's uh, workshop, the, the, a question came up about job paths, is that, do I remember Can we that right? This topic. First? Oh sure, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll go next. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely want to agree that networking and making personal connections is key. And I'll tell you one reason for that. Obviously, in my case, it, it literally got me a job right away. But but even when it doesn't do that, if you're applying for something, and with the internet, you know, maybe a thousand or five thousand people are applying for that same job. If you know somebody in that company, you know somebody who's friend of somebody in that company through your network, you can get your resume on the right person's desk, and that's how you get hired a lot of times mm -hmm. because very there's true. Too many resumes coming in. Yeah. So it's I can't say enough for personal connections. So build that. Um, I don't know. If, I may have missed it, but did you mention like volunteer at STC or volunteer mm. at some other organization? That way you can, for example, and that was again my plan before I got that offer at Sony, but you know, if, if you volunteer, I think I did it anyway, but you know, if you volunteer at STC or, or I guess write the docs or whatever organization, then you have the opportunity to make closer connections to people you mm -hmm. can have something that's for your portfolio and you have these people who can be your like recommenders right you know, Refer some know. companies want re references right they'll ask for references and so, so do something for free just to build up yeah. your portfolio mm -hmm. or, or help out a startup that can pay you either nothing or very little or whatever you know mm -hmm. don't don't be picky about your first job because that's not mm -hmm. don't worry about that's not your end game it doesn't matter just get some experience Mm -hmm. That will help you build your career, especially if you're right out of school. Um, and I also want to say um, it's really important to be really generally kind of open minded and, and saying yes to opportunity because you don't know where it's going to lead. So just really always be learning, always be exploring new things in the Bay Area. I can't speak for every city, but 
you know, uh, before COVID, there were like after work lectures in the city and sometimes in Oakland, just for, um, you know, you could learn new aspects of the field or some other field. So not only is that a networking opportunity, but, you know, you're just a technical writer is somebody who's always learning. You have to learn whatever you're writing about. So keep working on those skills and keep developing your expertise. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I want to say is that tech writing jobs are not always called tech writer. So you have, it's really hard in a sense to look for work because if you just look at jobs that say tech writer, tech editor, that's going to be a percentage of the jobs that are really that. So as I said, the, you know, the UX subfield has its own titles, UX writer, content strategist, or content designer is kind of where it's moving to. Uh, but, but in tech writing in general, you can often come under a whole lot of names. And the other thing I'll really say is get your resume in shape, get somebody to review it who knows the field. And uh, LinkedIn is almost everything nowadays. And mm -hmm. as far as contract work, people, I'm, you know, I'm established, but people are reaching out to me. Mm -hmm. right? So really have your LinkedIn profile solid and that will help you get jobs. I, I echo um, what Madeline says about flexibility, be curious and open and flexible. Don't say no, say thank you. Um, <laughs> Because you, you may think that somebody's idea or suggestion, no way, but you, you just, you don't, you're learning, you don't know. So just really be open mm -hmm. and flexible. And that's what, it, that's, you need to be flexible in these jobs too. Um, there's, uh, there's, yeah, and that's it's a key requirement at, at Salesforce, I think is, mm -hmm is to be able to do different things and turn on a dime when the companies um, or the department's priorities change. Um, you know, and, and that's a, it's a good thing, really. You know, many companies get stuck and are dysfunctional or, you know, or just are, are don't, they, you know, turning them is like turning an oil tanker and so they can't respond well to changes in the market. If you work for a company that does respond well to changes in the market without there being complete chaos, there there is no point. Um, there is a middle ground. Um, you 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 want to work in a company like that because it's it's good it's good for your job. It's it's good for the product. It's good for the people who you know the customers to for the company to be responsive in that way. So think of that as as a good thing. And then. Um, I was going to mention there, there's an organization called Write the Docs, um, which right. I don't know much about. Mm -hmm. but I, I know it's popular with some of the other tech writers mm -hmm. in Salesforce. So, and it's at writethedocs.org. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then the other thing I want to say is do informational interviews. Uh, you know, apply your, you know, be, meet, as Madeline said, go volunteer, um, you know, go to STC meetings, find, find tech, find people in the field and, and ask them, you know, for informational interviews, ask mm -hmm. if you can spend 15, 20 minutes, half an hour asking them questions. And most people are really happy to share what they know. Mm -hmm. And if they like you and there are openings at their company, they will be happy to recommend you. Yeah. If you're still in, school and in college you might be able to contact a, a writing professor and see if um, they can help plug you into internships i mean i certainly hired oh. several interns through the the uh, writing professor at santa clara so um, and they went on to become professional writers uh, technical writers um, after that so and they started out by doing sort of there's always a, a, a layer of, of, of activity the tasks that have to that are you know you don't need a lot of expertise to do but it, it gets your feet wet and I've hired several people to do uh, production work um, just basically you know converting a bunch of files from one software formatting package to another 
Um, and they started out by doing that on a temporary basis and then pretty soon got to know the product a bit better and then uh, was in a position to be hired. So, um, so starting in even at kind of low level repetitive tasks can kind of get you get your foot in the door. I want to add a couple of things about informational interviews because I want to second that that's the third that that's a great yeah. thing to do. Mm -hmm. I, I some people don't understand informational interviews as a concept, so I think it's important to be clear that if you ask somebody for an informational interview, often they will say yes. People are very generous in that way. But two things: one, it's it's good etiquette to thank them afterwards. That will make a good impression. And two, in the interview and right after like don't ask for a job don't say is there a job in the company that's not what an informational interview is it's to talk about the field and to talk about that person's expertise and they're doing you a favor don't put pressure on them by it's it's considered bad form if you ask about jobs in that interview so they may as kate said they may think of you later and go oh you know and there are some openings so, you know, they mm -hmm. might bring it up, but don't ask directly because that's not the point of the information. Mm -hmm. I'm, and I also, I want to echo about internships that that's just such an important way to get experience and find out whether you're interested in a field. And Salesforce has, Salesforce uses a lot of interns mm -hmm. and a lot of those interns end up uh, you know, coming on staff. Are, are internships generally advertised or how do you find them? I, I always kind of found them, as I say, by going through, say, a, a professor. <laughs> so I don't, um, I'm not sure how, how would you just go out and find an internship? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I know that Salesforce reaches, uh, Salesforce targets certain, uh, universities like Carnegie Mellon mm -hmm. has a technical writing program. So we get a lot of um, interns from there um, and, and certain other places. Um, so yeah, definitely talk to your, mm -hmm. your counselor. Just mm -hmm. Well, any other questions, comments? Uh, yes, I would like yeah. to, uh, before we go, I want to recommend two books. Uh, that this audience might be interested in. The first one is the first uh, book about technical writing that I read when I entered the field. Uh, it's a good basic uh, explanation of how technical writing is different from other writing, what you should do. And that's How to Communicate Technical Information by Jonathan Price. Mm -hmm. And the second author is Corman with a K, I forget what his first name is, but that's one of them. Um, and there is a forensic linguist named Roger Shuy, S-H-U-Y. Um, he has a book called Fighting Over Words. And it, he, he tells the stories of a number of um, court cases he's worked on as an expert witness. Mm -hmm. And several of them uh, involve things like uh, owner's manuals and warning labels, the sorts of things that uh, technical writers produce. And he has thorough linguistic analyses of those things and why they work or why they don't. So those are the good, two good perspectives on the field. Great, thank you. Yeah, I forgot to ask about your 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 linguistic foren forensic linguistics uh, uh, branch of your career there. So. Um, that I I just uh, I just gave a, a one hour talk about forensic linguistics that'll be on YouTube sometime soon. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Good. I'll let you know about it when it happens. Thank you. Nancy, do you have any uh, questions or uh, comments here to add? Uh, my, I always ask the same question in these sessions. How do you evaluate your own work or does somebody evaluate it for you? How do you know it's effective? Mm. From my point of view, I think that depends on the size of the company and whether they actually have resources to do any kind of evaluation. Um, one company I worked for, actually, we did put out a, a survey uh, of, of the various users. I mean, we were a small company and there weren't very many users at that, customers at that point. But we did um, kind of change our, our direction of what, what manuals we decided to put resources into uh, based on what they, they wanted. But um, 
Sadly, in terms of actually, uh, you know, doing usability studies of the actual document, that did not happen. Anybody else? Have you guys participated in anything like that? Uh, I've been in situations where we do A-B testing, peer review, editors as part of the team, mm -hmm. um, KPIs, which is a business metric to evaluate the effectiveness of something in the market. Uh, there's a lot of different ways it can be evaluated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we certainly did reviews when there were more than one of us in the department. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead, Kate. Uh, well, for documentation, uh, you can track page views, um, but we, mm. we look, so that's one metric that, that doesn't really, it doesn't tell you why people looked at a page, whether it was a you know a good thing or a bad thing, or mm -hmm. right. Everybody could have been saying, "Can you believe what the writers said?" Right. right? right. Everybody, and so there's big traffic to this one That's page. Right. That's yeah. Not very so clearly done. Collect if you can collect <coughs> on quantitative. If you can collect qualitative data from, mm -hmm. from users on your documentation, that's um, you know that's really helpful and important, and uh, you know looking at it regularly and and you know, and incorporating that feedback into your content strategy, um, you know, and we, we, yeah, analytics, any analytics that you can apply to your, to your documentation and to your, you, you know, you can instrument your user interface as well um, mm -hmm. and see, you know, how people are moving through your user interface. Right, and then you can identify patterns there too. I was just gonna mention two uh, more qualitative methods that I've been involved with. So I, uh, when I was at Sun, we used to do uh, usability testing on sections, not whole manuals, because that was too much, but on newly revised sections. So you get a few people in, one at a time, you show them the stuff, you ask them you know, uh, the questions, or you ask them the questions, how do you look up how do you know if you've got the syntax right for such and such a format? Mm -hmm. And they, they go in the documentation the way they knew, wait a minute, you reorganized things. Where is it now? Oh, oh, now I found it. This makes much more sense. Or mm -hmm. this is a crazy place to put it, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And then another case, we actually did remote usability, unmoderated. Have you, have you been involved in any of this stuff with user testing or user? Mm -hmm. I've, I've been involved with that. And that, that's a really interesting process because you can get some qualitative and some quantitative. It's, yeah, I, so you, I like I like to do the in-person qualitative. Right now, that's not a good option. Right, I love to do in-person, and even I lo love to do one-on-one, -on -one full-hour sessions. But that sometimes is not economical. Mm -hmm. So I I recall when I was at Financial Engines, this is maybe eight or nine years ago, where we had a little animation that was going to let you can't see my fingers. A short animation that was going to last about. 30 seconds or one minute, I can't remember. Anyway, really short. And so we put it out to an animation house, gave them the script, we told them what we wanted. There are certain rules about you can't represent money with a dollar sign or a coin because of the financial implications. So you're not allowed to do any of that. But you can represent money as a bag or you can re represent money in some other abstract way. And so we, the question was for the end users who were likely the target audience for the animation, which was going to be on a web page, but this, you know, if they chose to run the animation, it was like a little one minute film. And so we said, what was the message you got out of this, right? And we stopped it at different points and said, uh, what did this image represent to you? What did this, you know, mean for you? And then at the end, asked them to, you know, which of the summaries retold the story the best. So, you know, with a very brief time, 15 minutes contact with an individual, you can do a lot of things that will reveal to you where in your message things are weak mm -hmm. and that need to be more clarified or you know they don't hang together or whatever mm -hmm. so I, I want to encourage our our audience here also to recognize that there are both quantitative and qualitative ways to measure your work and you've named about 16 of them and i'm offering two more mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, sadly, though, I think that very small companies tend not to 
devote their resources to doing that, even though it's, you know, would be so useful. And yeah, it, it's arguable, it would leverage their scarce resources, um, you know, so that you're spending money on things that really reach the u your users and have an impact on the end user impact. experience, right? Exactly. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm happy. Are you happy? Yeah. And I think our audience is happy. People oh, I uh, so. who had to leave a little early <laughs> said thank you. So that was nice. And go forth and be wonderful for the rest of the day <laughs> and all the rest of yeah. your lives.